Okay, in the first part of this video, we're going to take a look at uh, three definitions which are easily confused with each other. And so uh, we want to make sure that it's clear that you really understand what's going on with them. So the first term that you're going to hear a lot in this unit is the term inertia. And inertia is an object's resistance to a change in motion. Now this is the part where you have to be careful because it's very easy to leave off this one term, which is change. If the motion isn't changing, inertia is not expressed. We can't tell that the object has inertia or how much inertia, right? You can feel the inertia of an object when you try to change its motion. Inertia can be described as a, you know the sluggishness of a response to a force. The more inertia the object has, the more slowly it responds to a force which is being exerted to the object. Inertia is going to be a property of the object. And basically, this property depends on how much matter it contains. Now, when we talk about matter, really what we're talking about are protons, neutrons, and electrons, because all objects are made up of those three fundamental particles. So, if you have something which is very dense, then those particles are all crammed very, very close together. And if you have something that is not very dense at all, then those particles are going to be spaced very far apart. So you can't look at the size of an object and think you have any understanding at all as to whether or not the object has a lot of inertia. Uh, for example, a beach ball is a fairly large object but the beach ball has almost no inertia to speak of. And then you look at a bowling ball, which is much smaller than a beach ball, and it's got a tremendous amount of inertia. So you can't look at the size of the object and know just from the size how much inertia the object has. The last property that I want to mention here for inertia is that it is not dependent on its location in the universe. So anywhere in the universe you take an object, it's always going to have the exact same amount of inertia. Now the other term that I'm going to talk about, which is very, very closely related to inertia, is mass. Mass is how we quantify inertia. What that means is we give a number to the sluggishness. Just how sluggish is it? So when we talk about inertia, we use the term inertia, or we use the term mass, we're talking about the exact same thing. The difference is the term inertia is totally verbal, totally conceptual. It is, um, it is not giving you a number. It's just saying that the inertia exists, maybe in large quantity, maybe in a small quantity, but the inertia is there that sluggishness of response. Whereas mass says, well, you know, we've got 100 kilograms, we've got one kilogram. Compare the beach ball with the bowling ball. The bowling ball is approximately um, six kilograms, and the beach ball probably is half a kilogram or even less than that. Okay, so now we're still talking about inertia, but we can talk about it very, very precisely through the language of mathematics. So it's inertia quantified. It puts an idea into the language of math. So it, it translates it. So these are one and the same ideas. OK, so the SI unit of mass is going to be the kilogram. Uh, this is part of the MKS system. Uh, in chemistry, you worked a lot with grams because you were using very, very small quantities. 
And in, chemist, in chemistry, they use the CGS system, which is centimeters, grams, seconds. But in physics, we use the MKS system, so kilograms is going to be our unit of mass. In the imperial system, which is the system we're actually most used to on a day-to-day -day basis, in the imperial system, uh, the unit of mass is the slug. And that would just be written with an SL if we were to abbreviate it. And the slug actually is short for sluggishness. We're never going to be doing anything with slugs. So I only put it out there just to let you know that there are two different systems. Obviously, the metric system is widely used. Uh, and then the imperial system, it's pretty much only used in America and I think maybe like one other country or something. So, um, you know, we're definitely the outlier here. And just like inertia, mass, because it's just a, quant a way of quantifying inertia, uh, you know, it's independent of the location. And then finally, this is the term that really gets confused a lot with mass because and that's going to be weight and um well i don't know why actually okay because they're two different things uh, mass is quantifying inertia weight is actually a force so it's a completely completely separate concept um the only thing i can think of is that so often um, in day-to-day -day living, we relate mass as a force. And so if you were to step on a scale in Europe, you know, you might say, well, how much do I weigh? And they might say 55 kilograms. Well, that's not a weight. That's a mass. And that's a special term uh, whenever it's used improperly like that, that we call mass weight because we're using mass as a weight but it's not actually a weight. So be careful with the term terms weight and mass because they uh, express two very different quantities. So weight is a force and by definition weight is an attractive force of an extremely massive object for a much 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 smaller object. And let me give you an example of that. Okay, so for example, these are easy. Anything that's on the surface of the Earth or on the surface of a planet has a weight. Okay, so we could be looking at um, a person in the Earth. We could be looking at a car in the Earth. We could be looking at something like a mountain in the Earth something as large and as massive as a mountain, we could still actually talk about how much weight the mountain has because the earth is just still so much more massive than the mountain. All right, so these are all things that we could talk about weight. Now, my non-examples are gonna look very, very different. When it comes to the non-examples, all the objects are pretty close in size okay and that's a loose term I mean there's a lot of flexibility there but for example or non-example uh, binary stars binary stars orbit each other okay and so you might have star 1 here and star 2 there star 1 might be more massive than star 2 so they rotate around that point that's the center of mass of these two stars. But what you could never, you could talk about the force of gravity, the force of attraction, because it's, it's there. It keeps them from separating from each other and just moving off into space. Um, but it doesn't describe the weight. The weight is something of a really, really massive object for a much, much smaller object. And so even though this smaller star out here on the right um, is, is smaller than the one on the left, it's not so much smaller that it would make sense to talk about um, the, the weight of the small star because you don't place the small star on the surface of the bigger one. 
One way of possibly recognizing this is the fact that the center of mass for these two objects, it's not located inside the bigger object. You know, I mean, that could be a very rough way of looking at it. And I know center of mass is something we haven't even come close to talking about yet, but many of you already have some exposure through earlier science classes as to what center of mass is. So, for example, if we're looking at the Earth, and this is the center of the Earth right here, and you have a mountain that's located right there, the center of mass between that mountain and the Earth might be located right here, which is still basically at the center of the Earth. In fact, it's probably going to be even closer than what I've drawn, but I wanted to make sure you could actually see that I put the center of mass in there. Okay, so that's not even anywhere close to scale, but you get the idea that we haven't shifted the center of mass of this central body by anything significant at all. Okay, so one non-example would have been a binary star system. Another non-example could just be, you know, two people standing side by side. Okay, will they feel an attractive force towards each other, a gravitational attraction? Absolutely. The units of force are going to be, uh, in the metric system, the unit of force, the SI unit, is the Newton and the Newton we use a capital N. Now some of you are gonna I know question uh, how do we know if the capital N represents North or if the capital N represents Newton? And the way you can tell the difference between North and Newton is its position within the numbers that you're expressing. So for example um, Newton is a unit, north is a direction, so if I had, you know, 18 meters, there's my unit, anything that comes after that is not going to be a unit, so it would be 18 meters north. On the other hand, if I wrote 18n, and then maybe out here, not to be confusing, I put an n, then I would know that immediately following my number, I have newtons or my units, right? 18 newtons. And then maybe that's pointing north. And to help prevent confusion, you might even write out the word north. Okay, so n is the letter that we use to represent newton. It's not a variable. So in the imperial system, you're very familiar with the units here, and that's going to be pounds. All right, pounds or ounces even. Okay, there's 16 ounces in a pound, so ounces is a unit of force, uh, not a unit of mass. You know, occasionally you are going to have to do some conversions here between pounds and newtons, and I believe that it is 4.44 or 4.45 uh, newtons per pound. So you don't have to memorize that, but I believe that's what it is. Weight is not the same thing as mass, and so weight is location dependent. And that's because in order to determine the weight or to calculate the weight, we have to know what the gravitational field is. And the gravitational field changes based on location. So by way of example, we have the Earth, and then let's do the moon. Now with the earth, we have, let's see here, mass and then weight. And mass is going to be equal to, I'm gonna make up a number, we're gonna say 18 kilograms is the mass of our object. If we put that object on the moon and we use a balance to determine the mass of the object, we're also gonna weigh or I'm sorry, measure 18 kilograms as our mass. If you're in transit to the moon and you use a special balance, you would get the same mass, 18 kilograms on Earth, 18 kilograms in transit to the moon, and then 18 kilograms on the moon. But if you um, were to determine the weight of the object on the Earth, then you would get approximately 180 newtons. And that's because weight, and we'll get into this more later, but weight, or we could say the force of gravity, 
is equal to mass times the gravitational field. And so if I just say that G is approximately 10 instead of 9.8, I come up with 180. Now, the moon's gravity is one-sixth of Earth's gravitational field. And so that means the weight on the moon is going to be approximately 30 newtons because it's going to be one-sixth of 180. So it's approximately 30 newtons. So you can see that your arms wouldn't get as tired if you just had to hold up whatever this this object was that's 18 kilograms like you know maybe it's uh, um, roughly something the size of a bowling ball on earth if you're holding that in your hands your arms are going to get tired pretty quick but on the moon you know you're not going to get tired very quickly at all because it weighs so much less but it still has the same amount of mass okay so just a very brief summary of everything that we did here uh, we were just looking at a couple of terms and we want to be careful never to confuse these terms and they're easy 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 to confuse now the first one is inertia and mass and inertia and mass are basically one and the same thing um, you know inertia is qualitative inertia is qualitative it's a, or I should say it's a qualitative way of describing the sluggishness and mass is a quantitative which means it uses numbers, but it's a quantitative way of describing the sluggishness. Weight is an attractive force of an extremely massive object for a much smaller object. And then finally, our units of force are going to be uh, newtons in the SI system or in the metric system. And then in an imperial system, it's pounds.